Hello, everyone. This is Amanda Coolong with This Week in Cloud Computing, and I have my voice back this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to hear your voice this time, Amanda. I was in, Thank you. Last I, week, you were very quiet. I, I think was, you liked me being mute. No, not really. I like I like having you talking, and you know, okay. you know, Mr. Greenberg there needed a little bit of rebuke in here. This and there, is so. true. Everyone, this is Mark Jeffrey. If you did not know, my co-host. Thank you for being here. Hey, my pleasure as always. Uh, we've got a lot of things happening this week. Um, first off, if you haven't noticed already, we have a new site, thisweekend.com, that features all of our shows across the board. So please check that out. Um, and we've got a lot of stuff happening. If, we, if you would like to join the chat, please do so on the site as well. Just log in there. Um, you can also join us on Twitter um, at TWICloudComp and the hashtag cloud. So um, one last thing too, obviously we've got some great sponsors. We, we do. have Verticore. Yes. And we also have Storm On Demand. Storm On Demand, I'm sporting my, He's sporting my the very shirt. fancy, yes, actually from the normal camera. Yeah, there we go, you can see my Storm On Demand <laughs> t-shirts. And our little men. It. There's like a little storm thing, so if I want to like be Superman, I can do this and fly away. Anyway. So you're probably wondering where our guests are. They're joining us virtually today. So we've got a great show lined up. We're going to be speaking with Treb Ryan, who is the CEO of OpSource. So Treb will be getting to you shortly, and, and also Eugene Steinberg, who is the CTO of Grid Dynamics. But first, we have the news. So. <laughs> Let's begin with story with Eucalyptus Systems. They've had a shift in management, so they've replaced Woody Rollins with former MySQL chief executive Martin Mikos, who was at EIR Benchmark Capital. Wow. Now, Mikos is being tasked with turning Eucalyptus into a big business, which likely means raising more money. Now, word on the street has that the company is looking for about a $100 million valuation. That's quite a hefty valuation. It's pretty big. So the question is, and I will throw this out there to both you, Treb, and Eugene also, if you would like to chime in, how much is Eucalyptus really worth? And does the addition of Mikos add enough value? How, why, don't, why don't we start with you, Treb? Yeah, I, I think the addition of Martin's great. I mean, I worked with him over at MySQL and right. uh, knows how to take an open source co uh, company and really make it a standard. With that addition, yeah, $100 million, sure. Um, you know, we just saw 3Terra, which does a commercial version of kind of a cloud management platform get picked up by um, CA for 30 times revenue. Now, no wow. one really knows what that revenue was, but uh, word is there was 100 million, you know, if not 100 million, somewhere close to that. And uh, Eucalyptus has probably a far greater reach uh, in that environment with a with a, a, a Series A type, I mean, a Class mm -hmm. A type CEO like Martin. I don't see them having a real problem getting that type of pre-money. What was it? What was it? So they raised mm -hmm. initially. They raised five point five million from yeah, Benchmark. from Benchmark and so, BV Capital. Right. So now, how long? Now, how long has it been since they raised that round? And uh, you know, and, and basically this um, this valuation. Do we know the answer to that? Or I'm not sure. What about you, Eugene? What do you think? Uh, well, uh, thinking about the Calypus, we tried that technology a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it is a really interesting technology. Uh, from uh, my perspective. Uh, currently, Eucalyptus has a very interesting position and uh, is uh, becoming a real player on the private cloud market. However, uh, this company will experience real, really big concurrency on this market because, for example, there are other companies like which was recently acquired for by by company called Computer Associates. Mm -hmm. So. This, this basically means that uh, really, really serious players start to look into this market and they have their channels uh, which will allow them to move uh, the adoption of uh, uh, private cloud solutions, their private cloud solutions into large enterprises. Mm -hmm. This will allow uh, them to kind of uh, easily leverage their channels and uh, Eucalyptus, I, I don't think that, that, that they have such a channels and uh, Right. That means that they will have a hard time competing with these companies on the mm -hmm. open market. Do we know how they arrived at that $100 million valuation number, though? Do you, do you know the answer to that? Uh, it uh, has uh, more digits in it than 99 million. No, I don't know how they got this uh, valuation. They have pretty interesting technology, uh, but this, well, this is based on a lot of open source components. And, right, uh, right. I, I have a hard time understanding how that bunch of open source com components can, can, what, what can, kind of, can bring up this valuation. Sorry, Eugene, what, what kind of revenue do you, are they doing? Do, you, do we have any idea of that? 
maybe maybe five million, maybe ten maximum. All right, so this would be mm -hmm. a significant, like a twenty x or ten x, you know, exactly revenue valuation, which is, which is pretty we damn did, high. Did, and you've got to consider. Really for me. Yeah, and you also have to consider too. I mean, there there are a lot of players in this market, you know, in terms of the open source space. Right. What are they going to do in terms of that? Lots of big competitors, and not only that, but Eucalyptus is giving away their core software, but they're making money from add-ons and proprietary extensions. Yeah, you, you can so. make a business out of an open source. You know, that's been proven before, right. so you, it can be done. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is 100 million? Is it really worth that? And uh, my guess is no. But this is a frothy market. You know, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, as we discussed on every show, there's a lot of action around cloud computing, mm -hmm. and they're clearly a cloud company. So um, yeah. I think they're getting, they're getting a lift from the bubble. Would be my guess. True. True. Well, let's move on to story number two. Um, there was a CIO.com survey recently where IT pros um, are actively engaged and confirming strong business interest in analytics, cloud, and collaboration technologies, but not everyone is deploying cloud. So as it specifically relates to cloud computing, 57% of the 405 respondents surveyed have analytics on their radars or are piloting technology, but only 15% have deployed cloud technology. So the question is, what's the holdup? Are we not ready for the cloud? Is there something that we're missing here? Treb, what do you think? Well, you know, this is still really brand new stuff, right? I mean, we've only had cloud, and I think when we talk about cloud, we should probably uh, be very specific. Cloud infrastructure, um, the ability to get uh, resources such as the you know, network and storage and systems over the cloud as opposed to cloud applications and the like, which I think if you took the broader cloud it would be much bigger. But on cloud infrastructure, it's a still a very new product. And, and a lot of what's out there is very immature. I mean, um, I, I think that, you know, from a, a perspective of a corporation that's used to having control over what they're doing, uh, that's worried about security and performance, you know, what's out there today is still brand new. And, and you know, while probably most believe they will adopt it at some point, they're, they're mm -hmm. waiting for the tools to get a little more mature before they jump all the way in. True. All right, um, next story we have, according to another survey conducted by Vansom Bourne, 52% of 200 CIOs polled said they intended to make changes to their existing data center environments, but just 18% of those wanted to make changes planned to do so and um, to enable the cloud. So seems like we've got a trend going on here. So um, the next question here is, is cloud computing just a fad at this point? Mark? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I don't think we'd be doing a show if we thought it was just a fad. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm going to say no. I'm going to go out on a little limb here and say no, I don't think it's a fad. Right. Um, I, I think that, you know, as we've discussed almost every show, it's, it's, it's the, descri the definition of what cloud computing is mm -hmm. changes depending on who you are. A lot of people tend to do cloud wash their products. Yes. Um, but I think in general, the, the trend of, of virtualizing your infrastructure to someone who actually has the hardware sitting on their site, that's going to continue and going to get bigger. Everyone's, Microsoft announced last week they're betting the, the company on the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's something that's it's not a fad, it's here to stay in some form. Exactly. Um, that, just a quick side tangent here. Eugene, how do you define the cloud? Well, uh, basically, this is the most a, mo a most complex uh, question. <laughs> so basically, the uh, uh, cloud is uh, basically a, sy a synergy of uh, many well-known technologies, mm -hmm. which work together to um, offer much more flexible, manageable, and inexpensive IT services and IT infrastructure. This okay. is a real disruption. All the rest, which is called cloud computing, uh, is uh, basically there icing on top of of a of a, of a, of a sure. right. oh. sure. And don't worry, Trev, we'll get to you on that question in a bit as well. But to move on, I want to go to story. The next story for many um, workloads, the cloud appears to be replacing the grid. So let me give you one example. Yeah, what does that mean? I, I yeah. actually read this. I wasn't sure. You know, what, what's the difference between the cloud and the grid? Well, exactly. That's, well, that's a whole separate question yeah. we could get into. Um, but for this specific one, well, let, me, let, let me just sure. let me just kind of uh, try to answer the question: What is the difference between the cloud and the grid? Okay, go ahead, Eugene. So, uh, in terms of uh, well, grid computing is is well known for kind of decades, mm -hmm. and it basically mm -hmm. operates uh, on the level uh, of uh, sending a workload to particular engines which uh, reside somewhere in the internet and can process this workload. But the level in, on which the grid computing works is basically the level which we are, we, we are 
relying on the particular software which is installed on those engines. Hmm. And uh, the main difference between that and the cloud is that cloud is, operate, is operated in fully automated provisioning of those engines. And it relies heavily on top of virtualization. And basically the virtual machine itself becomes the engine on which the workload runs as opposed to in grid computing, the special software which needs to be installed, provisioned, and configured that can process the workload. So what? this is the main difference between grid and cloud. Got it, so, so, so the grid is something like when NASA put out their, um, the, SETI, the SETI at home project, right? Yes. So they have these huge data yes, sets. SETI at home is a grid. So that would be Amazon grid computing. So just to make sure everyone's on, mm -hmm. on the same page. So, so uh, SETI at home was, that you basically install the screensaver on your right. machine. Um, NASA would chop up the data that it was receiving from the giant antenna arrays it had around the world mm -hmm. um, and give you a little parcel of it that when your computer was inactive, you weren't doing Microsoft Word or whatever, you were just sort of sitting there and a screensaver was running, um, it would start chomping the data. And it would assemble, mm -hmm. then when it was done chomping it, it would basically send it back to NASA, say, yes, I found a signal, I found aliens or whatever. Largely not, aliens. but you know, if they, they discovered, if they discovered a, a signal of interest, it would be highlighted at NASA's end. So that's so there's a grid of these computers. So that's different from the cloud, where you basically, right. you know, we're, we've discussed a million times over there, so I won't get into that. But nonetheless, so mm -hmm. so so basically, the thesis here is that the cloud is a, is replacing the grid. Yes. So so I'll, please continue. With that in mind, well, this is good because we are an educational show to really break up cloud computing. We try. We try. So what we're getting at here, consider research-driven cloud computing, for instance. Um, the European Space Agency, which is using Amazon EC2 for the data processing, processing needs of its Gaia mission, um, which is, set, I think, launching in 2012, um, they're using um, 40 gigabytes per night that Gaia um, will generate um, that would have cost $1.5 million using local resources. Um, but research suggests it could cost, uh, cost about $500,000 using EC2. Oh, wow. So that's a huge difference. So um, the question then is, will cloud services displace high-end supercomputers or, or replace the grid? What do you think, Treb? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably throw this back to Eugene, is, is he knows the grid better than I do mm -hmm. and how it's used for those kind of highly specialized. You know, but for batch processing, you know, and for, for large jobs, the cloud definitely has its place. I mean, we're seeing that uh, in our own environments, and I know across the board, that if you need a, 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 an undifferentiated amount of computing uh, for a period of time, um, the cloud's often much faster and easier than, than pulling up the physical servers. If you're doing a heavy load over a long period of time, um, and you have a specific need for um, some uh, specialized software across that load, and you know that load's going to be high uh, over an extended period of time, months or, uh, of time or, or later, sometimes those economics don't work as well. Um, and so I, I always think it's, it's tough to talk about the cloud just in terms of economics because sometimes it's fabulously better in economics, and sometimes it's more of a toss-up. It might be better to own the, uh, own the equipment. Okay. Eugene, what about you? Do you think that cloud computing is going to replace the grid? Uh, well, actually, uh, from my perspective, uh, cloud computing and well, cloud computing can 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 be viewed as a something uh, as, a, as, as a as a very convenient way to deploy a grid right. on something. So this is more complementary things than uh, kind of. Uh, directly uh, substitutable things. Mm -hmm. So uh, the cloud computing, well, in our company, we used uh, cloud computing infrastructures on public cloud providers and on some private cloud to deploy really, really large scale applications, but we always used some sort of grid computing middleware to drive the actual workload. So th those things are complementary and uh, cannot substitute each other. Yeah, I was going like to yeah, I was going to make the point earlier that actually a lot of a lot of these companies that we've been talking about they're getting acquired mm -hmm. essentially have implemented grid technology in their cloud offering mm -hmm. and that's how they provide it. Right. So, um, so you could it's it's they're the same thing in some respects. Yeah. So. Grid technology in the cloud. Yes. Well, let's move on. Story number 6. Um, I think we're at 5 actually. Or 5 maybe. You're right. See, I don't even my numbers straight today. Um, Canonical, the company that is behind the Ubuntu Linux distribution, has announced the official launch of the Ubuntu One music store. Um, so, I mean, this is pretty big. I mean, now what is it? So basically, 
Is it like iTunes or? But not, it's not closed off. So anyone can go yeah. in? Yeah. So anyone can put their music up and yeah. anyone can, now by closed off you mean you, you don't have to be a record company. Exactly. So if I'm just a musician, I can just upload whatever I want into mm -hmm. it and sell it for whatever price I want. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, I mean, you, you've got this, this young cloud startup and Datamation predicted that they would be a hot cloud startup this year. Would you say that something like this piece of news really backs that up? Were they right? Do you think this is going to be a big deal this year? What do you think, Treb? <laughs> you know, I, I like Ubuntu. Um, it's a desktop operating environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're a cloud environment, and now they're a music store. Um, you know, that's a lot of products from, from a young startup. Uh, <laughs> completely different areas. I, you know, I have to admit, I didn't get bothered down in their email to say that Ubuntu's doing music. Um, and that's probably going to be one of my funnier stories of the week. Uh, <laughs> you know, the funny, uh, you know, you take a look at Amazon, who also, I guess they're figuring if Amazon can do cloud and do music, then why can't they? Um, if they've had a hard time competing with iTunes uh, in that environment, uh, it would be tough, you would think, for a company that was focused on making what was supposed to be a great desktop experience and is now kind of branched out in some really interesting things on the cloud, would, would also have the media pull uh, to grab the, the music store business as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other piece of this, too, is um, with Ubuntu One, you can also store other kinds of information, too. So documents and images and things like that. So they're kind of being spreading themselves out beyond even just the music piece to compete with a Google and right. you know Zoho, the likes of that. Well, it's interesting because Amazon, you know, Amazon basically built out their their music store and or their media store, right. called media in all its formats, books, etc. And then they were just sort of done. You know, there was mm -hmm. really nowhere else to expand. Yeah. And so they looked at their assets and said, well, where else can we expand? Well, we've built this great infrastructure. Why don't we rent it? Uh, that works for us. We built it for ourselves initially, but why don't we turn around and rent it? Ubuntu has basically done the opposite. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the inverse play. They built the infrastructure for us and said, yeah. oh, this now allows us to get into content and distribution of content. So it's, an, it's interesting from that perspective that sort of one is equivalent to the other in some respects. Mm -hmm. Although I, I do agree that it's, you know, from a business perspective, having focus on all those three areas uh, yeah. is really schizophrenic for any company. Yeah. So. And what do you think, Eugene? Do you think they'll succeed at this or are they getting a little too scatterbrained? Well, uh, from my perspective, uh, I, I, I'm not quite uh, understand uh, how the uh, fact that uh, Canonical deployed their uh, analog of iTunes Store is related to basically cloud them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in any case, then every every solution which can store some information on the internet in this case becomes a cloud, right? And we, and uh, a, lo a, a lot of companies try to currently kind of write this hype and uh, utilize that as a kind of to position themselves as a cloud company. Mm -hmm. The cloud, the storage in the cloud becomes, or storage in the cloud or any other service in the cloud becomes a cloud if it becomes a middleware for other applications mm -hmm. which can be, which can use that as a service to, to build on top of that something new and interesting. Okay. And if you have just music store or just uh, file store in the cloud without an API or, or without a layer which will allow to you to build something on top of that. This is just a, a file storage and nothing more. Very good point. That's my perspective. That's the real benefit is file storage. <laughs> there you go. Not a bad point. All right, so story number six. Um, this one's just kind of a fun one I had to throw in there. If you look at all of the information assets that Google is investing in the cloud, you have results, you have ads, you have real-time index. You mean search results? Mm -hmm. So search results. Yeah, okay. search results. Gmail, documents, files, books, filters, health transactions. You have all of these things that they're investing in the cloud. Um, so are they becoming the cloud? Will search just become a feature of Google, and will they literally own the cloud? Mark, what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, there's a lot been a lot of talk lately that Google is becoming. I mean, there, there was an article I read this morning that Google's becoming a country. With this whole stuff that's going yeah. on with China, they pulled out. They're almost acting like a miniature nation. Yeah. Uh, and and their ability to sort of influence world politics. So, um, <laughs> so I, I think I think if they can become a, a miniaturized nation, I think that they can certainly 
It depends what you mean, are they becoming the cloud? I don't think they're going right. to be the only cloud provider. Yeah. I don't think anybody thinks that there's going no. to be just a one ring um, for the cloud that, no, you know, to rule ring, them No, one ring, but the all. chat room yes. says there should be one ring. Well, I, <laughs> I, I do know that they're saying there could be only one, which is Highlander, which is very this different. This is true. So, yes, one of my favorite movies. So, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I don't, so, in other words, I don't think Google is going to be squishing everyone out of the cloud business. Of course, they're going to be a major player. Mm -hmm. I think that's just obvious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's time to give some sponsors some love. What do you think, I think Mark? Well, absolutely. Always happy to give <laughs> sponsors some love. Um, so this week we're going to start with Verticor. So uh, this weekend is actually hosted on Verticor. Mm -hmm. So they're they gracious. They've really been awesome, uh, you know, just in terms of the support, in terms of the uptime. I mean, just everything we, we would hope for is there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Verticor.com is where they're found. Um, if your cloud hosting provider is letting you down, then we definitely encourage you to take a look at Verticor. Um, they're more secure and more reliable than other like cloud vendors. Um, managed private cloud solution can easily replace your current IT infrastructure, eliminate your IT pains, no more IT guys running around telling you no, <laughs> just do what you want. Um, completely avoid the cost and hassle of maintaining your own equipment. Nobody likes all wires and boxes and things. It's, just don't worry about it. Just basically log in and set your own cloud up. Uh, you can de deliver 100% uptime to your end users. Uh, configure and deploy your resources in just minutes. Basically, they give you a little panel. You type in what you want, and off you go. You're off to the races. Um, your private cloud is hosted in the most advanced and secure data center, so you don't have to worry about you know somebody breaking in or it breaking down. You don't have to worry about the physical physical equipment. Uh, best in class hardware and software, um, and it gives you access in, to a virtually unlimited bandwidth. Um, so, Verticor is a team of experts monitor and maintain your private cloud 24 by 7 by 365, uh, freeing your internal staff to concentrate on supporting only your applications and projects that can help grow your company. Verticor is at verticor.com. And of course, you know, we have to give shout outs to our sponsors. They really support us here. You know, they support new media, and we wouldn't be able to give you this great content without them. Yeah, the show, the show is not possible without these folks. So, for heartfelt yeah. thanks to both our sponsors and NetDNA as well. Of course, and NetDNA. And actually, in the chat room, I'm, they're saying Viticor. It's not Viticor, it's Verticor. Verticor. Yeah, I'll, I'll type it in right now so everyone knows where we're Yes, what everyone we're in the about. chat room, make sure you check out Verticor, and he'll be adding it. Shortly. There we go. Um, are we? I think we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty with Treb. So um, I think we're going to jump straight into a discussion with you, then Eugene. Um, I would really like to, you know, do a warm welcome here with you again. Um, Eugene again is the CTO of Grid Dynamics, and Grid Dynamics, according to Gartner, Gartner the analyst firm, is um, the most experienced scalability and cloud consulting organization. That's that's pretty hefty there. Um, when when did that analyst report come out, Eugene? You there? Oh, basically, this year, uh, this, this report came out this okay. year, I believe. Congratulations on that. So, Eugene you. has, um, you have a PhD, you're the CTO for Grid Dynamics, um, and you've got quite an, an impressive background here. I mean, you've specialized in scalable architectures, um, as well as for applying emerging cloud computing technology and enterprises. Um, you've got experience at extreme transaction processing systems, design, and, and a large variety of scalable commercial and open source middleware, too. So that's, I, you know, we keep talking a bit about middleware here. How did you get into this business in the first place, Eugene? Well, we uh, started that company uh, with, uh, starting with a uh, project with, com with PayPal to oh, okay. build a okay. large scale fraud detection system for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, back then we uh, uh, had uh, not a deep uh, kind of uh, knowledge in uh, all the cloud computing and uh, grid computing things, and uh, and basically uh, we started to kind of from solving very very pragmatic and practical problems on how they are uh, really a scalable uh, system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the system uh, which, which uh, can detect fraud in real time with low latency and high throughput. And this was a very, very exciting project with a huge company which has a really, really a huge workload. And uh, this allows us to build a really, really uh, relevant experience in how would you build a scalable system. Right. So when for and, uh, and for me personally, it was uh, the very excited, excited opportunity to apply a lot of kind of theoretical computer science knowledge and uh, uh, some practical knowledge in building scalable systems, uh, which I which I've got uh, 
to a real, real massive scalable problem. Mm -hmm. So two, two questions very quickly. Um, first one is, when was this that you started doing this project? Right. Well, it was, two, it was 2006. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so fairly recently, not yeah. like back in 2000 or even, right. you know, I was just curious. It's still four years, and I guess yeah. one, one point that I wanted to raise with this, um, Eugene, a, a lot of people keep saying cloud, 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 at, you know, starting last year, but really, cloud in different iterations has been going on for a number of years now. Yeah. Well, he started yes, great. You know, yeah. actually, a lot of people think what you can do uh, in the cloud, and a, a, a very few people say what we did in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, in, in, in this uh, situation, we kind of one of the few consulting companies which really did something uh, real in the space of cloud computing and the space of uh, sc scalable mission critical applications. I think you're. And, I mean, I think uh, you're. Cloud. Sorry. I was going to say, I think your your uh, application is very interesting. So you, you basically, PayPal came to you and said, and I'm going to try to characterize it just to make sure everyone, we're on the same page here. PayPal came to you, they've got a problem with fraud, right? So people are entering in, people are stealing mm -hmm. money from each other, entering in false, you know, uh, Visa accounts, et cetera, mm -hmm. and actually beating the system and getting money out of it in various ways. And so with Which these, is, sorry, Eugene, what? This is not exactly oh. the, the vertical problem with fraud. This is a problem of scalability. And uh, this is a problem which algorithms which PayPal used to kind of detect and prevent fraud right. uh, didn't scale well. Oh, and it didn't scale well, they, okay. They okay. Had, okay. And, they, they, and workloads which we had in, the, in that company are really huge. It's one of the biggest financial institutions in the world. And uh, uh, they required to go in a little different or maybe not little, but revolutionarily different paradigms of uh, moving the application to grid computing infrastructures, to be able to harness uh, hundreds of machines and to distribute their data right. to uh, deliver the required throughput and performance and latency. So that was the core kind of expertise and core value which we brought, we brought to, this, to our customers. So enable, so and, basically, uh, yeah. So being able to do yes. fraud detection effectively, you need massive scale. There's no way to sort of do it yes, at a smaller scale. That's the biggest. You, you will have you will have a massive a massive amount of transactions. Is you'll it have, so? The uh, reason for the scale in your end is that there's so of financial transactions per second, and you will need to uh, deliver the data to those transactions with uh, about 50 millisecond uh, time and well, mm -hmm. and that's that's that challenges in in in, in current stack of technologies. And you should should be very very clear to partition your workload and your data to satisfy that requirement. Um, one thing I wanted to jump into a little bit, Eugene, you've got some pretty impressive marquee cloud projects that you've done for Macy's, for Seagate, for Cisco. Um, with these large companies, what what were they looking for? You know, what what were some of what are some of the consistent questions that you get across the board from them? Yes, so those large companies, we are basically for long looking into the cloud computing, and we are trying to find their path to kind of try uh, the cloud computing in uh, different uh, in different applications we have. The first and most simple uh, use case uh, we uh, implemented and deployed for some of our customers is called Cloud for Quality Assurance. So in this, in this solution, we basically uh, can deploy uh, the particular uh, enterprise technology, which is basically a cluster of machines, mm -hmm. which serve, for example, a large e-commerce web website on the cloud to allow quality assurance people from, from, from that company to deploy on demand uh, any particular version of their uh, system to, to, to make all kinds of testing upon all that. So that, that streamlined a lot uh, the process of quality assurance in our customers. Okay. The, second, uh, the second use case which we deployed is basically uh, some uh, of our clients uh, in, in, in financial industry. They are very interested, they are very interested to, uh, pro to process their very large Excel worksheets on the, on the grid and cloud environment. Really? Excel worksheets. I've never thought of a cloud yeah, yeah, you know Excel worksheet. Financial, financial analysts, financial analysts, they think in Excel, and of course, 
Interesting. Uh, uh, okay. A lot of financial institutions have that huge Excel worksheet which uh, takes uh, hours to recalculate. Yeah. And uh, they are very, very interested to be able to run that workload on, on the grid, not on their own mm -hmm. workstation. And this is something mm. which, uh, which we've done with, uh, uh, with help of, well, with, uh, with partnership with Microsoft, we've done that uh, for some financial institutions. Right. Yeah, I was actually curious how, in fact, you went about doing that. I don't think Microsoft just allows yeah, you to exactly. rip open Excel and do it, you know, obviously yeah. distribute so file yeah. system all over the place. We are technology partners with Microsoft. We are working very close to this, uh, this Microsoft uh, development team to build their solutions around ability to run uh, massive Excel uh, workloads on the cloud. Interesting. Do you think you'll be productizing that anytime soon? Yes, we are productizing that. I would think so. Oh, very good to yeah. know. We'll have to keep, uh, keep in touch about that. Well, I want to do another quick sponsor break because I think we hear something here in the studio. Do you? I believe that we do. I feel my voice getting louder. <laughs> More superfied, if you will. Yes. Storm on demand. Storm on demand. Which storm I'm wearing, on by demand the way. and storm, storm on, on demand. demand. Right here. <laughs> uh, it's an infrastructure as a service cloud computing platform that is powerful, powerful enough to replace dedicated servers. Storm on Demand is a proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web. Uh, they're one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. Uh, easier and less expensive than other leading cloud providers. Uh, features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, backup and restoration cap capabilities, and pay-as-you-go utility-style billing. Uh, some of their options, cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Ubuntu mm -hmm. again. Ubuntu. Uh, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, Private networking and much, much more. Also, a very cool. Oh, we didn't make our little guys go across. Wait. Oh, our guys. We forgot to like do. So, yeah. So make you the mean, guy go across. Here's your guy. Oh, we got a guy. Okay. Also, they have cool guys. See. A big feature. Cool we make guys. Them go across. Right. Storm on demand can be found at stormondemand.com. So go there if you're looking <laughs> for a cloud solution. Uh, we suggest you know listen to our friends at Storm on Demand at stormondemand.com, and of course Verticor too. Give them both a shot if you're looking for something like exactly. this. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with our silliness, everyone, but we love our sponsors. We do. So I want to jump into a discussion now with you, Treb. Um, so Treb Ryan is the CEO of Opsource, and you're focused on cloud operations coming from the SaaS space mainly, correct, originally? Yeah, we were originally, uh, our, our, our primary customer base is software as a service companies. Mm -hmm. um, from traditional companies moving into SaaS like Adobe and SAP to dedicated software as a service companies from big guys like Taleo. Uh, and exactly down to startups like Java. Mm -hmm. And now, one one piece of interesting news already here is that your OpSource cloud is out of beta. So what does that mean for people now? What can they expect with your cloud? Well, OpSource cloud was, was our first opportunity for enterprise customers to use the uh, OpSource infrastructure uh, directly um, and uh, to start using it for enterprise compute purposes. In the past, you know, anytime they were using us, they were using us through one of our customers, um, such as Adobe or, or, or BMC. But uh, now they can actually, you know, get the best of the cloud, um, the, you know, the immediate availability, uh, the, the incre highly incrementalized pricing, the, the, um, the ability to, you know, use APIs for burstability and expandability, but get that in a far more kind of enterprise fashion. So, you know, we did a lot of things around private networking within the cloud, uh, offering enterprise tools such as VMware and uh, Microsoft, uh, doing user controls. And what the SLA is really about, um, when we came out of beta, was that we wanted to put our money where our mouth was. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we figured if we're going to spend a lot of money uh, putting in the type of redundancy that's gone into place uh, with the way we're using uh, multiple systems for the virtual machines. If we're going to make private networks that allow people to have, you know, layer two, 10 gigabit connection between their virtual instances within the cloud, if we were going to offer support for even someone who's only paying us, you know, seven cents an hour to have live customer support, we should stand behind that. And, um, you know, the SLA was a way of saying that, you know, we were the first uh, to offer a latency SLA. Uh, between the systems and, and, and say you, any of your systems can talk to each other in less than a millisecond, so you can do complex applications. Um, we were the first to offer a guaranteed response from live support and uh, on emergency response, be back on top of it within 30 minutes. 
uh, for emerging situations. And, and, you know, with all the money we spent on uh, instance availability and really building out a enterprise class architecture and infrastructure, we also agreed to give 100% uptime on your instance availability, saying once you have an instance going, it's always going to be going. It doesn't mean it will be perfect from our side, but uh, we're in the same boat you are if there's any problems. Trev, would you, would you think that, or would you agree that every cloud computing provider should offer a 100% uptime SLA? You know, I, I don't actually think so. Um, okay. You know, I think I, I think you need to look at who you're targeting and, and how you're targeting them and, and, and what they're going to pay. Uh, I think it, what we see is current cloud prices today. Um, if you're if you're paying, you know, the equivalent of, of three or four cents for a CPU and you know a, a couple of pennies for a, a gigabyte of RAM and you know three hundred pennies for a gigabyte of storage. Yeah, you should give that kind of SLA. Um, the fact is we know that we can do that in this environment. Does it mean that someone's not going to want a lower availability and pay less than that? Uh, sure. Um, I think if you, if you want to offer lower levels of service um, and you're willing to charge less for that, people may not need that same type of availability. But at the price points we're seeing today, which is funny because just a year or two ago that seemed so cheap, and now we have people, uh, you know, literally going three one hundredths of a penny an hour for a gigabyte of storage. Oh my gosh! I want that completely SLA'd. Um, I think that that's something they should expect from their vendors uh, at, at today's price points. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys also have achieved your SAS seventy Type Two audit. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. You know, we actually have a number of audits. It's part of it. that. Really comes out. Wait. Of the what is that? <laughs> exactly. We should explain what these things are. A little exactly. Bit. I don't yeah. think everyone we talked knows. a little bit about audits on the show, but yeah, yeah. if you could clarify and, and for maybe, everyone. Maybe I don't know either. So, so I'd like, like to know. You know, there's a, a number of different uh, agencies that will go out and uh, and set of um, standards that are based on how you uh, deliver your services, the way you encrypt your data, uh, the security put within your data center, where, where some, uh, someone is effectively coming in and you're stating, this is how I'm going to secure the customer's data, this is how I'm going to lock down the data center, this is how I'm going to manage the systems uh, from the application level down to the OS level. Um, and by doing so, you get a stamp of approval that this is qualified to, to run certain types of applications. The SAS 70 is often used for financial applications, um, mm -hmm. for people who need to get Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, PCI okay. is the one that's usually used for consumer credit information. Got it. Uh, for, for medical data, it's either HIPAA or CFR Part 11. Uh, if you want to do business in Europe, you usually need to get a European Safe Harbor certification. And in cloud infrastructure, you know, and using cloud to get servers and storage, there really hasn't been a lot of that yet. Matter of fact, cloud infrastructure has been pretty insecure up to now. But for cloud applications, SaaS applications, you know, the world we come from where people are already putting business data out there, it's pretty much a requirement that you have at least one of those certifications and often three, four, or five. I mean, I, I tell you, we get audited. I, I personally just got background checked by the Canadian government. Um, really? I passed, by the way. Much Good, I was going to say. I hope you didn't fail. Yeah. I, guess that, <laughs> I guess I guess it didn't make it north of the border, but uh, yeah. I mean, these are the types of things for, for people, you know, to get comfortable with using the cloud, which, it, which you know, we actually believe can be quite a bit more secure than, you know, corporate data centers. You don't have to worry about laptops and security mm -hmm. zones. And, you know, all of my employees are background checked, and including me now, um, by the Canadian government specifically. <laughs> uh, they, they, that, you know, you can use the cloud with confidence. You're going to have to show people that. And, and much like, you know, companies get financial audits so, so investors can, you know, believe their financials are on the up and up, these types of uh, uh, SAS 70 and PCI audits allow people to understand that their data is being treated the same way. Sure. Now, Trev, one thing we've talked about on the show here before is auditing and the fact that there's no real standardization when it comes to the auditing process. You can have one guy come in and, you know, give you one certification or not, and then the next guy comes in and gives you a completely different report. So would you say there's still a need in the market right now as far as cloud computing in general goes to have a more standardized audit process for cloud? You know, and that part about auditing not being consistent from one to the next is true with certain types of audits. Okay. Um, so the SAS 70, which we most is the most common and usually the first one people get, um, you can, you know, which are, the audit's consistent, but they're auditing you against your stated process and procedures. Uh, it's many ways like an ISO uh, a certification that you say you're going to do something a certain way and then they audit you do that. Things like PCI and HIPAA, have a far more rigid set of requirements uh, around how it's done, and so not only do you have to show your, you know, show you're doing it, but you have to do it a certain way. 
you know, I, will you need one of those for cloud? I, I think it's really going to be more application dependent because, you know, medical data may have a different set of requirements mm -hmm. than consumer credit card data. What I do encourage and what any good provider should do is uh, provide you a copy of their audits um, on request. Um, so, really you know, point. the fact is, you know, if, if everybody can do it differently like they do in SAS 70, then you should be able to show what your SAS 70 audit uh, is there. And for us, we not only show our customers what our SAS 70 audit is, we show our customers' customers. So anybody mm -hmm. who's using us who wants to go to their customer, because we're getting their application certified as well as uh, our environment, and, and it's a little different, we'll actually send their end customer, whether it's a GE or, or Boeing or whoever their end customer is, or, or Country Computer in Scotland, a copy of our SAS 70 audit so they can review to, to, to make sure it follows their procedures. Gotcha. Now, one thing I want to highlight with you specifically, Treb, you sit on the Software Executive Board at the SIIA. Um, what, what's some of the discussion that's happening around SAS at that level? Yeah, it's funny. SIIA has been one of the better, uh, more progressive uh, um, companies in the space, you know, our organizations in space and, and understanding what was going on with SAS and where it's coming mm -hmm. and what's happening. Um, I think a lot of what really is coming around uh, cloud for software companies, you know, the first was, what does it really mean to be software as a service? And initially, everybody thought it was about taking your application and just charging monthly for it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that now within the SIA and, and with most people in the space, what they realize it's really about the cloud, right? You know, it's really about the internet. You know, we asked earlier what my definition of the cloud was. It's that little squiggly drawing at the top of the architecture diagram that represents the internet. <laughs> you know, Jason uh, Drogi said that same that, thing right? last it's, week. Yes, Jason the cloud, because that's what we, how we drew it. And and what's really going on here is the internet is getting used for business purposes now. You know, it was essentially a consumer, um, a consumer data, you know, a consumer tool. Um, is now being used for businesses, which is not a big surprise because most people under the age of thirty who are in businesses. They're only technology tools, the internet right. is their prime technology tool. And they're looking at, you know, client server, the stuff that came out of my generation. It looks like, you know, it looks like green screens and mainframes. <laughs> so what, what the SIA and the companies in there are realizing, you can't just take what you did in client server, you know, charge for it monthly and have it be SaaS, right? It's got to be, to be truly in the cloud, it's got to be a true web application. Take advantage of that immediate availability, the, the API level capability to, to integrate that with other applications. You know, the, the ubiquitous access. Uh, that comes along with the cloud if you really want to be successful there. Now, people pretty much understand that. Now they're mostly just figuring out how to get their sales numbers up. True. Well, on the consumer side, really quickly, would you say that the general consumer's understanding of the cloud is just SaaS at this point? I think the consumer understands cloud better than the... the <laughs> I mean, you ask, you ask my, my five-year-old what the cloud is, and he can tell you automatically what the cloud is. What he can't tell you is what physical media is. Wait, wait, wait. What, what does your five-year-old say the cloud is? I'm interested yeah, in your, I, I know. the five-year-old definition of cloud computing. You know, it's, well, for him, it's just computing. You know, I, I tell this story all the time. He was one day sitting on YouTube. Um, I've got three kids, which means we stopped raising the third one. He's raised by his brother and sister. And as a result, he learned to use YouTube before he learned to read, which I, I don't understand how you can find the Potter Puppets video when you can't read, but he could. And, and so he's watching these videos, and I asked him to eject the DVD out of the computer. He's like, well, I said, get the DVD. Your mom needs it. He goes, huh? And I finally leaned over, and I ejected the DVD out of the computer. And he goes, there's a DVD in there? He had no idea that computers There's physical media in there? DVDs. And so when you ask him what cloud computing is, he probably wouldn't actually know the term because all computing he does is cloud computing. That's very interesting. That's a very good point. And, and, and this kid's a dork, obviously, you know, like his father. When he <laughs> grows up and becomes the CIO of some organization, he's not going to be sitting there going, yeah, now I'm going to start installing computers and building out data centers and building firewalls. He's going to expect everything to come off the net and come out of the cloud. Um, and, th and that's really what I think what's so fascinating about cloud infrastructure and SaaS now is we're taking this that was used to get the Potter Puppet videos and we're making it a tool that people can really use to solve business problems. And, and, and that's, 
that's what's new. When, when people say cloud's been around for 15 years, it has. But the idea of being able to get a server on a cloud in five minutes flat and get it anywhere. I mean, you can configure almost anybody's cloud service off your iPhone in a coffee shop now. You can spin up a brand new server in a coffee shop at any point in time you want because of the APIs you can use to get in there. This is new and very interesting. Now we need to make sure someone does that, doesn't go put the corporate financials on that server they just spun up and share it with everybody else in the coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's kind of the next evolution for us as a business perspective. But really with the cloud and SaaS, it's really still about how you can use the internet for business purposes. Well, really quick, jumping back over to you, Eugene, any final thoughts from you on where things are going? Where are things going specifically for Grid Dynamics? What did I say again? <laughs> Sorry, I said fi any final thoughts from you in terms of wh where cloud is going or more specifically where things are going for Grid Dynamics? Yeah, we see uh, in Grid Dynamics, we see more and more traction from our clients and prospects to implement different uh, cloud computing solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, to say uh, about uh, where cloud is going in general, I see a lot, uh, a lot of traction to move some, uh, some data in the cloud, meaning that uh, it would be really interesting to uh, put not only the raw processing power in the cloud, uh, and not only the, uh, some basic storage capabilities in the cloud, but to put some uh, useful data feeds in the cloud, meaning that any application which you write uh, and which runs, which, which runs in a uh, cloud computing uh, uh, environment can, can access to such data as, uh, for example, weather feeds, market feeds, mm -hmm. uh, different historical information, uh, a lot of kind of business facts and everything else which you can imagine. And Google has uh, a very good trend to, to move more and more information uh, being accessible for different programmers to write application again. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting trend which I see in the cloud and I believe that uh, the cloud providers of the future will integrate not only uh, raw processing and storage capabilities in the cloud, but also some meaningful data sets which will be right. available for people right. which run the applications in the cloud. Well, thank you, Eugene. I, I think I'm hearing something again, Mark, do you? Do I, you know, I think, I think you may be right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I, I may hear some Or maybe balkans. I just have, yeah, ringing in my ears. Once again, I feel my voice growing deeper. My superpowers are returning. That's because I'm talking about storm on demand. Storm on demand. That's right, we have our little guys now. Infrastructure as a service, cloud computing platform, powerful enough to, to replace <laughs> dedicated servers. Uh, a proprietary cloud platform, Storm on Demand, was designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. That's more than I was when I used to play with things like that. Anyway. So Storm on Demand is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. Storm on Demand features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, backup, and restoration capabilities, and pay-as-you-go, utility-style billing. Storm on Demand options include cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and much, much more. And I have a shirt that says Storm, Storm on, on Demand. Demand. <laughs> Thank you, Storm on Demand, once again, for your generous sponsorship. <laughs> We, we got to have fun on this show. We really do. You, we have to. You guys have to put up with us. Thank you for doing that. Um, some final announcements. Um, we're going to be featuring a product of the week. We are. Actually, it's going to be a new segment starting next week. New segment starting next week. So if you have a SaaS product or not, it, you know, just it has to, to be a cloud product. It has to be a cloud yeah, product. Of course, it, cloud. it is a cloud show after all. Come in here with your rector set or something. It has to be a cloud <laughs> product. So, you know, there's that. And then also, of course, we're always looking for guests, particularly folks from your infrastructure team. Um, definitely, you know, yeah. got our feelers out for that. Yeah, we like to feature the folks too. The other thing we like to mm -hmm. tell people is we love to feature your product. Um, the product manager in particular is the one mm -hmm. person we're most interested in speaking mm -hmm. with, um, or the CEO. So mm -hmm. both those people we feel represent the product best. So people know the if you do have something and you want to tell us about it, pitch, P-I-T-C-H, at thisweekend.com is the place to send it. Um, that'll go directly to Amanda, myself, and a few other folks. So pitch at thisweekend.com. It actually goes for any of our shows if you have an idea right. for um, a guest or something like that, uh, or an application, or even a show. Mm -hmm. So pitch at, pitch at, I almost said Storm on Demand. <laughs> <laughs> Not pitch at Storm on Demand. Pitch at thisweekend.com is a place to send it in, so. 
And one other fun little tidbit I want to throw out there, we've been discussing how we can involve all of you that much more in the show. So we're going to start crowdsourcing our show notes. So all of these cheat sheets that we have on our screen, we're going to yeah, post so. them ahead of time. So if you have anything you want to add, um, any questions for our guests, we'll be able to do that online before the show. Yeah, you'll be able to see it beforehand. Exactly. So if you want to add to it, you think there's something that actually you think is bad. Because we want your involvement. Yeah. So make sure you, you know, keep your eyes open for that because we will be crowdsourcing our notes fairly soon. So we should probably start wrapping up. I would like to thank our guests, Treb Ryan, the CEO of OpSource. Thank you for joining us today. Treb, is there um, a Twitter handle or a website you would like um, anyone to visit uh, for OpSource? Yeah, go to blogs.opsource.net. You'll get mine um, in there. Uh, is that is that where do I have to go though to get one of those Storm T-shirts? <laughs> oh, you want a Storm T-shirt? I think you we could arrange the guests that. The show, you'll get more guests if you get Storm T-shirts. I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently there's only five. They made a couple for us. So actually, yeah. the person who designed the logo actually complained to me on Twitter that they don't even have one themselves. So <laughs> I'm out word to my next conference if 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 they if they send one to me. Will you Did say you, will you use Storm? the voice as well? It has yeah. to be storm on demand. Yeah, storm on demand. Yeah, so if you say, we'll have to practice that. But anyway, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you out. <laughs> so thanks again for joining us. And also Eugene Steinberg, the CTO of Grid Dynamics. Thank you so much for joining us. Is there a Twitter handle or website you would like people to go to? Oh, uh, thank you for calling me. Uh, basically, uh, well, uh, go to griddynamics.com, see our blog. All us on Twitter. And what's the Twitter handle? Grid Dynamics. Grid Dynamics on Twitter as well. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter as well. T W I Cloud Comp. Yep. Tweet Cloud Comp. And you know, make sure you're checking out you know the discussion around the show. But finally, we've got to thank our sponsors. We've got Verticore, and we have Storm On Demand. Yeah, and I but want to make sure Verticore doesn't get lost in all the exactly. Storm On Demand. We love them too. And, and exactly. You know, they host this weekend. I could be more happy with them. So thank you once so again. So of course, you know, please if you can thank them on Twitter. Tell them you know that you've been hearing about them on our show, and they're really what makes this possible. So please make sure that you thank our sponsors and Verticore, Storm On Demand. Thank you. And of course, my co-host, Mark Jeffrey. Oh, my pleasure. You know, I got to be every week. So every week, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific time, make sure you catch us here. I'm Amanda Kulong, This Week in Cloud Computing.